Great, great. I think we're live and a big good morning. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Welcome. I see the numbers are creeping up, which is great news. This has been a very, very popular webinar this morning, and we're so, so, so pleased that um, nearly 300 of you actually have signed up for the webinar today. As we let people enter the room, let me assure you, if you are here to listen about diversity and inclusion in the financial services sector, you are in the right place. And it brings me great pleasure to introduce you to the financial services team. I'm Sasha. I do know a lot of you in the room, but for those that I don't know, Sasha Molotsov and I lead the financial services diversity and inclusion practice. Um, you will notice that we are recording this webinar. Uh, we do have a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I've got to say, we were so, so, so grateful and so pleased that many of you sent in your questions ahead of this webinar. And what we're going to do is really try to get through as many of those questions in our remarks as we go. And if time allows, at the end, we will have some more questions live. We're not expecting any kind of drills here on the video end, uh, so we hope to get you away promptly for a 10.30 a.m. finish. Let me start by, by reflecting where this has all come from and, and why the FCN PRA Consulting now. I think that's a good place to start. Uh, look, I think we can all agree that the consultation papers or the CP, um, as I might refer to, uh, these haven't come out of the blue. In fact, the market has been anticipating these for a couple of years now, and particularly on the back of a number of regulatory initiatives. The most notable one, I would say, is the joint discussion paper between the Bank of England, the PRA and the FCA in 2021, really looking at the role that firms have to play in advancing diversity and inclusion, and the role that the regulators equally have to play. Now, the FCA has been most active since then. In April last year, of course, the FCA set very clear expectations when it comes to listed boards around diversity. Other initiatives include pilot surveys. There's been a lot of literature reviews, information requests. And in December last year, we saw a paper about how firms were actually managing diversity and inclusion risk within their firms. But alongside these regulatory initiatives, through government-backed programs like the Women in Finance Charter, through sector-led voluntary initiatives, many that people in this room have worked really hard towards, we've all been pushing for change. We've all been pushing to have underrepresented minority groups, in particular women, those from ethnic minorities, and more recently from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, really, really focused on within the financial services sector. And that's because data shows that these minority groups, particularly women ethnic minorities, have poorer outcomes. They're paid less, they're promoted less, they a lot of the time find it very hard to even access our sector. And even when they do, they very struggle, as we've seen through data, to reach the top ranks in our firms. So it's important that when we go through these consultation papers, we keep those, those facts about the employee experience in our sector very much anchored in our thinking and anchored in our approach to these consultation papers, looking at the employee experience and what role, I guess, firms like yours have to play and look, there's recognition through many, many, many people in this room, enormous program, uh, progress has been made. But what the regulator is saying and what the industry is calling out for is faster progress. It's incredibly inconsistent across the sector, and this is why regulators are getting involved. So their role is to create the frameworks for all of us as a sector collectively to get where we need to go but putting you, the firms, at the heart of these proposals. And really what I think is focusing greatly on proportionality, on transparency, and very much on accountability. So on the next slide, you will see who is going to share their thoughts with you today. 
So we're going to focus, Georgina and I, and I'm sure many of you know Georgina, we're going to do a bit of a side-by-side -side comparison, focusing on where the FCA consultation paper and the PRA one differs. There are nuances, and for those particularly in the dual regulated firm space, some of the things to note. We're going to look at the governance and the cultural aspects, and my colleague Shrenik is going to take you through in particular uh, looking at individual accountability. And many of you have asked, how do these measures compare with existing regulatory initiatives and expectations? We're going to look at next steps because I think the most important part is what firms do now. And if time allows, we'll have some more questions. So let me introduce you formally to Georgina Philippou, who I think, you know, given her 30 year career at the FCA needs very little introduction. But for those of you that don't know Georgina, Georgina was an executive director at the FCA at the Enforcement and Market Oversight Team. She then went on to be the Chief Operating Officer. She chaired many, many boards, the FCA's Executive Diversity Committee, the Operations Committee, and the Public Sector Equality Duty Working Group. She was a special advisor and before she left the FCA was very involved in helping form shape the FCA's proposals when it comes to diversity and inclusion in the regulated space. She continues her work on DNI, and i we're delighted to have her here today, whilst focusing on her NED career, her passion for the arts, and already having positions with the FRC and Citizens Advice. Georgina, over to you. Thank you, Sasha. And good morning, everyone. It's really encouraging and slightly daunting to see so many of you here today. Thank you for giving up your time. And it's really encouraging and slightly daunting to see the many questions you've already submitted. I can't hope to do them all justice today, but I hope I will meet the needs of those of you who wanted an overview of the proposals, but you still need to read the CPs for yourself. And I'll pick off some of the questions which personally I found very interesting. And I promise you, I'm not just picking off the ones which I think are easy. So where are we? On the 25th of September, the FCA and PRA published their long awaited and much anticipated consultation papers on proposals to improve DEI in financial services firms. This follows 2021's discussions papers, which received a near record number of responses for a DP. And I do think that the CP shows that the FCA and PRA have listened to the feedback. So it's well worth you responding to the CP too. Taken together, the papers are important because they provide a direction of travel, they explain why change is needed, effectively setting out a problem statement, they argue the business case, they explain why this is a regulator's as well as a regulatory issue, and they set out expectations clearly, including the measures which they think will have the greatest impact once implemented. Now, the problem statement, as the FCA sees it, is that the UK financial services sector is not diverse, and there's plenty of data to back this up. For example, when I was at the FCA, less than 20% of senior management function holders were women, and there was no ethnicity or other data. And I don't think much has changed since. So this week's UK Board Index report shows that in 2023, three out of 20 new CEO appointments were women, and four out of 22 new chair appointments were women. And it really isn't much better looking at across other demographic characteristics. You know, the Parker Review, looking at ethnicity in FTSE companies, shows that over 100 of the FTSE 250 companies have no ethnic representation on their boards or no data. And looking at social mobility, research from the Bridge Group shows that nine out of 10 senior roles in financial services are held by those from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. And that those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds take 25% longer to reach senior levels with no link to talent or performance. Finally, the UK financial services sector has the widest gender pay gap of any UK sector. A PwC report says 27% compared to a national average of 12%. And if it carries on closing at current rates, none of us here this morning will be around when gender pay parity is reached. 
Now, all of this cannot be good for UK consumers of financial services. The FCA Financial Life Survey showed that consumers from minority groups experience unequal outcomes and barriers to access, from basic bank accounts to access to venture capital funding. Other work from Fair by Design shows that those from a lower socioeconomic background, perhaps because they live in certain postcodes, or come from ethnic backgrounds, perhaps because they have unusual surnames like Philippou, cannot get insurance or have to pay more for it. So what the FCA wants to see is the benefits of D&I in firms feeding through into better consumer and market outcomes by reducing groupthink, by supporting healthy work cultures, by improving understanding of and provision for diverse consumer needs, by unlocking diverse talent, and for the PRA enhancing the safety and soundness of the sector. To support all this, the FCA did an extensive literature review in 2021, which Sasha has mentioned. This looked at 169 academic and other studies, which looked at the business benefits of DNI. Generally, these studies show positive correlations between increased DNI and elements of firm performance, especially those so called softer elements, such as a sense of belonging, commitment, well being creativity, innovation and problem solving, attraction and retention of talent, and in terms of corporate governance and risk management, such as better decision making and better conduct outcomes. Incidentally, in the last few weeks, an article in Harvard Business Review shows that a sense of belonging reduced sick days by 75%. So there you are, that's a hard and a soft measure. So there are also benefits in terms of financial outcomes, such as profitability and share price performance. And there's a great international study which shows that countries with more pro progressive DEI laws and attitudes have healthier markets and economies. However, as the FCA Literature Review acknowledges, the business case for DEI, at least as represented in these reports, is nuanced and complex incomplete and in some places even contradictory, and the reports are of varying quality and reliability. But I don't care. I don't care if some people see the business case as flawed, because I find it a bit distasteful to talk about business cases in relation to an issue which is about equality and fairness and morality. After all, no one asks you to prove that the status quo produces the best outcomes. In fact, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that it doesn't. But the minute you start to talk about changing things, you have to produce a pile of evidence. In this context, it's interesting to note that the FCA steer, steers clear of the moral or ethical case for D&I. But if you're looking to move the dial in your own firm, you might need to throw everything at it. The FCA also published the results of a piece of multi-firm work, which again, Sasha mentioned briefly, after the DP, which is well worth reading if you want to see some very practical examples of good practice and to see what's not working so well. All of this is happening in a wider contextual environment where ESG has climbed to the top of the agenda for most firms, although the E has tended to overshadow the S, which is where D&I normally sits. It sits in a wider contextual environment where firms are facing new and complex challenges, where government policy appears to be conflicting on D&I, where there are continued financial services failures, which are at least in part due to groupthink. So this isn't just about the 2008 financial crisis. And where other D&I initiatives, such as women in finance, ethnicity at work, progress together, and lots of others have done fabulous work, but progress has been painfully slow as the data we have shared shows you. Anyway, let's get to the punchline. What exactly is the FCA proposing? For large firms, the FCA is proposing some new minimum standards to raise the bar. So there are four key headings. Number one, firms should have D&I strategies. And note here, the terminology has moved from policies to strategies between the DP and the CP. So it's a small word, but a big difference. Those strategies should set out board responsibilities, objectives and goals, plans and measures, obstacles and how they will be overcome and how staff awareness will be raised. 
Secondly, firms should gather and disclose data annually. At the minimum, the data should cover age, sex or gender or both, disability and long-term health conditions, religion and sexual orientation, with other characteristics such as socioeconomic background, parental and caring responsibilities collected on a voluntary basis, plus some inclusion questions based around the psychological safety metrics in the Financial Services Skills Commission Inclusion Measurement Guide. And the FCA will probably use all of this data and metrics to publish an anonymous aggregated annual report to hold the sector to account. Number three, firms should set targets for underrepresented groups in that firm at board, senior management and all staff levels. The FCA hasn't, hasn't mandated those targets on the basis that no one size fits all, but it does expect firms to be able to explain the targets they have chosen and provide a rationale behind them. And number four, the FCA also proposes that D&I matters should be considered a non-financial risk and treated appropriately within firm governance and decision-making structures. In connection with this last point, the FCA also plans to publish further guidance on what constitutes non-financial misconduct and when it will be considered relevant to fit and proper assessments. The FCA does make some helpful statements in its CP, but the line around where it will act and where it will not seems to me to be still a bit blurred. So this might be an area where you might want to provide feedback to the regulators. What is not blurred is the assumption behind these proposals that in today's world, as a senior leader, what you do in your working life and in your private life cannot be entirely separated. For small firms, the FCA has taken a proportionate approach based on where small firms are on their DNI journeys. And the proposal is that those with 250 employees or fewer will have to report their employee numbers annually and report non-financial misconduct. Now, of course, the FCA's existing conduct rules, fit and proper assessments and threshold conditions don't cut off at 250 employees. So they will continue to apply more broadly. Now, almost as interesting as what the FCA is proposing is what the FCA is not proposing. So it has ditched proposals around individual accountability, talent pipelines, succession planning, training and remuneration on the basis of the feedback to the DP or other information which suggests that these proposals are too costly for the benefits produced, too prescriptive or not impactful enough. So the FCA is clearly trying to focus on the minimum measures it can mandate to move the dial. But this is a consultation and you know it's still at the beginning of the journey, so things may well change over time. Now, I'll just pick off some points of interest for you based on the questions you have already submitted. So as I mentioned, the FCA has abandoned a proposal to mandate individual accountability for DNI, but intriguingly, it does hint in the context of risk and governance that support functions such as HR and corporate responsibility, which often sit under the COO, can contribute to progress. So the FCA is looking for collective accountability through the board and the executive at a strategic and policy level, supported by individuals and teams across the organization to ensure that strategies and policies are effective, implemented and monitored. The FCA also recognizes an important role for the second and third lines of defense too, which in some cases I think might need to be upskilled or even call in external assistance if they're to ensure that DEI is effectively treated as a non-financial risk. So as I said, taken together, it's clear that the FCA sees DNI as being a cross-organizational issue rather than one just belonging to corporate responsibility or HR. You ask in your questions if the FCA has missed a trick when it comes to small firms. I can only answer by saying that the work of the FCA has shown that many small firms have barely taken the first tentative steps on their DNI journey. It may well be that after a period, there will be more definitive requirements made of small firms too, 
But at the moment, it's clear that the FCA is trying to achieve something which is proportionate and flexible. At the other end of the scale, larger firms are saying that this will be difficult to implement in a global context where there isn't regulatory convergence across the world. This is a challenging area, but not impossible. Global firms are used to creating overarching brands or cultures or values with room for local differences. Global firms can choose to operate to the highest bar, which right now would be the FCA bar, or they can choose a two stream approach with a high bar in some areas and a lighter touch in others, or they can take a more flexible but more costly jurisdiction by jurisdiction approach. But the bottom line, as, as the FCA expresses, is that if as an entity you're regulated by the FCA and your activities are carried on from an establishment in the UK, you will have to comply with FCA rules. And you ask if all of this is compatible with the Equalities Act 2010. The FCA CP sets out its, its view that regulatory DNI falls firmly within its statutory objectives under the Financial Services and Markets Act and its three year strategy to improve outcomes for consumers and markets by promoting competition and positive change. It explains how its proposals sit alongside other important initiatives, especially the consumer duty and its work on vulnerable consumers. But it says less about the Equality Act, specifically the fact that it is a public body under this act, and therefore it has a duty to eliminate discrimination and pro promote positive relations between those with a protected characteristic and those without. And I talked about um, data collection, the proposed requirements around what data to collect on a mandatory or voluntary basis don't exactly line up with the Equality Act. But the FCA has made its decision on what really matters in today's financial services firms and what firms are already collecting. Finally, you ask a very good question, is the FCA warming up the industry for a sixth conduct rule? And I honestly don't know. Um, on the one hand, it seems to me that the, what the FCA is proposing in, the, in this CP sits neatly within the existing conduct rules, which are after all about integrity, skill, care and diligence, being open and cooperative with the regulator, having due regard to the interests of consumers and observing proper standards of market conduct. I take the same view about the five conduct questions, which are about identifying, managing, improving and monitoring conduct risks. But it may be over time, if the FCA does not see progress in this area, that it will consider something more specific and more exacting. Um, and that might be a good note on which to leave things and let others talk about the PRA approach, conduct, culture and uh, accountability and next steps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgina. Um, Look, I'm going to turn now to the dual regulated firms in the room, and, and actually that's a lot of you. So I'll take you through, you've heard Georgina talking about what's in the FCA papers, and I'll take you through the nuances and the differences um, with the PRA papers, and also acknowledging that you know some of you in the room also have responsibilities uh, within the Lloyd's London market as well. So the... The PRA is coming at this from a different perspective, slightly different. You've heard from Georgina that that focus on safety and soundness of firms is really, really key. That's their statutory objectives. But it's all around how can diversity and inclusion really improve the quality of decision making, reduce risk, that group think, and really look at how the overall prudential risk management of a firm can be improved. So there's, you know, kind of no surprises, therefore, that the PRA paper focuses greatly on governance. It does focus on accountability, which is quite different, as Georgina said, to the FCA paper. Risk management, a much greater emphasis on the role of the board and the explicit involvement of risk and control functions. And look, that's both in the design of DNI strategies and also from an effectiveness perspective. So in this room, we've got non-executive directors, we've got senior leadership, internal auditors, compliance in the audience today. So it shows that already you're all thinking as a collective effort. I want to make a quick remark first on scope because there has been an update from the PRA in, in the last week, actually. 
So when it comes to the PRA, it's UK banks, UK designated investment firms, building societies, and solvency two firms, and very much anchored in where you have establishments in the UK. This includes third country branches, but there's some exemptions as we go through. Now, until a week ago, the PRA said that friendly societies are out of scope, but has since updated the fact that if you fall within Solvency 2, you are a friendly society, you are absolutely in scope. I'm going to ask Rima, thank you very much. I want to talk about here on a side by side and just pick out a couple of nuances um, when it comes to strategies. So you heard that all firms need a strategy, irrespective of size. Now, the PRA adds some layers here, saying that it doesn't just want firms to have a strategy at the firm level, it expects the board to also have a bespoke DNI strategy. Now, third country branches, you're not going to have a board strategy, you will have a group strategy. And even those, as Georgina said, that have that kind of international context, you must articulate how this applies to your UK operations. Now, there's a proposed rule change. The rules currently set out that boards need to publish just a policy at the moment to promote diversity. The rules are changing to say that boards need to publish a strategy to promote diversity and inclusion. And this also relates to sub board committees, of course. Now, there's no expectation that the smaller firms need to have a all singing, all dancing, complex DNI strategy. But what is expected is that the board strategy is published on your website, the firm strategy is published on your website, irrespective of your size. When it comes to monitoring these strategies, the plans, again, there's a new proposal for a rule change. The new rule will require all firms in scope, this includes third country branches, to internally monitor diversity and inclusion. And that's really about making sure that timely interventions are made and we're moving things along. So larger firms will need to do this annually, smaller firms uh, probably you know, less frequently than that given the proportionality considerations. Now linked to the monitoring and linked to strategy, risk and control functions, this is where the PRA paper is more explicit. Again, irrespective of your firm size, there is a role for the second and the third line, and many of you are in the room. And that's an active role in the development at the start. So, you know, internal audit, risk compliance should be involved in the development of strategy when it comes to DNI, as well as supporting accountability on the way. And that means making sure data and findings and management information is going up reported to the board, to senior leadership. That, that monitoring piece, program uh, progress, sorry, is, is monitored, outcomes are tested. And whilst a lot of the firms that we're working with at the moment have done great, great, great work, it's that outcomes testing bit that a lot of the firms are now starting to think about. And the point is that deficiencies are addressed in a timely way. When it comes to whistleblowing, the PRA also calls out the importance of the control functions, you know, making sure systems are working, processes are in place, and really to make sure this is not going to be a tick box compliance exercise, that diversity is embedded across the organization. I want to move on to the next bit. Georgina talked about targets. Um, Georgina talked about kind of reg reporting disclosures. Now, to be clear, uh, the dual regulated firms, you only need to submit one report, right? Third country branches, uh, board targets don't obviously apply to you. Now, a number of you ask questions around um, who, who you need to report on, particularly when it comes to the board. Some of you are not counting in your stats at the moment, non-executive directors. Now, the FCA, uh, the FCA makes it very clear please use the PRA's definition when it comes to employees. There's in the, if you look at their kind of appendices in the guidance notes around how you're going to make these reg reports and disclosures, please look at that definitions because you'll need to bring NEDS into scope. 
Now, the FC and the PRA, while saying firms, you're at the heart of targets, we're not going to tell you what targets to set, although last year the FCA did say we expect 40% women on boards, 10% ethnic minorities. In this case, they're not setting targets. The FCA is a bit more relaxed, actually. The FCA have said, you know, as long as you have one target, you know, we'll be comfortable with that, but explain it. The PRA is not so relaxed. The PRA has said, because of that employee experience, because of the data we know is in the market, we have expectations that firms, and this is for the larger firms, to set expectations when it comes to women and ethnicity as a minimum. If, of course, the firm identifies underrepresentation in this area. So the FCA hasn't called out women and ethnicity, the PRA has, and set, you know, a minimum expectation there. But look, irrespective of whether you set one firm, whether you set, um, sorry, whether you set one target or five targets, the point is in the reg report, in all of the documentation, the regulators expect to see rationale. They expect to see evidence of the thinking that's gone behind these targets, how you plan to meet them, when you plan to meet them, and how these targets apply to the board, to the senior leadership, and also at the employee level. The next bit I want to touch on before handing over to Shrenik is the additional requirements of the PRA paper. Now, board governance, and you know, if you are a third country branch, make a coffee, this bit is not for you. Um, look, the PRA is very, very clear that you know the board is responsible, responsible for setting the monitoring, delivering on the strategy, both the board strategy and also the firm strategy, as I said. DI is no longer going to be an HR responsibility or an ESG responsibility. It is very much a collective responsibility, but the board is on the hook to make sure that they address gaps of underrepresentation in a very timely way. So there's a real shift, in my view, between perhaps more passive boards in the past when it comes to these kind of non-financial risks to very much active boards now. So a lot of language from the PRA as to what boards are expected to do. And that includes, of course, the relevant board subcommittees. So the monitoring is key, making sure targeted interventions are made, but holding you know, management to account is a really big deal. And, and thinking about incentives, a few of you have asked in advance of this call, you know, what kind of incentives, remuneration, et cetera. The PRA is clear that it shouldn't just be limited to remuneration. You really need to think about what's going to work for your firm, how you're going to embed the culture, and make sure that responsible SMF holders are accountable. And we'll come on to SMF. Board succession planning, there's a tweak here to the rules too. Currently, you need to kind of consider in your plans the broad set of qualities and competencies. The rules now say that it also should be considered in the context, you know, explicitly uh, in the context of diversity. Now, as I said, the listed firms will already have diversity in its thoughts, um, but what the PRA says, it is not going to accept that there's not enough talent out there. It's tricky when it comes to the executives, but they want to see evidence that firms are really looking at recruitment methods, really looking at the pipeline, the talent, the whole employee life cycle, and holding executives and third party suppliers to account. Now, I'm going to stop because that accountability is key here. Uh, Shrenik, please join me. Shrenik is a leader in our risk and governance team. He leads a lot of our culture reviews, a lot of our board effectiveness reviews, and skilled person reviews. So over to you, Shrenik. Thanks, Asha. And really lovely to have so many of you join us today. Diversity and inclusion is a topic that's personally very important to me. And whilst there's still more to do, it's great to, and really exciting to see some momentum and positive direction of travel from the regulator. So we've heard so far about the FCA and the PRA proposals, some of the similarities, but also some of the contrasting approaches to regulation. However, if there's one clear, consistent takeaway from my perspective, it's that the ownership and accountability over diversity and inclusion, particularly for diversity and inclusion and for dual regulated firms has been well and truly raised. So on that note, and I appreciate you've been patiently listening, 
Uh, I thought it would be interesting to start off with a question. And so, so the, the question is, to what extent do you agree that your board and senior management function holders should be responsible for advancing diversity inclusion in your firm? And we've got three options, agree, disagree, or neither agree nor disagree. We'll give it 20 seconds just to see your responses and receive your responses. Do we think board and SMF holders are responsible for advancing d and in the firm? Let's bring up the results. Wow, okay, an overwhelming majority went with agree. Uh, sort of what, what I expected actually. Um, and um, yeah, I think I think absolutely a, my my view would be that's that's very true. And I'll I'll come on to um, some of the points in relation and uh, all the evidence which really back that up. And I guess very much related to that poll, I received a question in advance of this webinar, which really intrigued me. And that was, well, where do you actually see accountability of culture and di diversity inclusion sitting in most firms? And I guess to answer that question, I need to be a bit precise and, and I'll break it down into two categories. For those firms which are dual regulated, the PRA expects senior leaders to be accountable for the firm's diversity and inclusion strategy and outcomes. You heard that from Sasha. But actually they want to expand the scope of prescribed responsibilities, which have historically been in relation to culture. So specifically this prescribed responsibilities which are being expanded are PRI, that's responsibility for leading the development of the firm's culture. That's typically held by the board chair. And then PRH, responsibility for overseeing the adoption of the firm's culture in the day-to-day -day management of the firm, typically held by the CEO. But in practice, what that really means, is the chair is ultimately accountable for ensuring the board sets and adopts an appropriate DNI strategy. And the CEO is accountable for ensuring that strategy is implemented across the firm. From a senior manager's and certification regime perspective, those responsibilities for diversity and inclusion should be reflected in the accountable senior management function holders statement of responsibility. The regulator desires that those that are accountable and, and hold responsibility demonstrate reasonable steps. And that is of course that they're expected to deliver results, but also they should be transparent about success and failure, even if that's sometimes the harder thing to do and making targeted interventions where necessary. In other words, the PRA makes it clear that SMFs would not be held to account for a failure to meet diversity targets. That's not the intention, but actually sets expectations that those that are accountable are able to discuss the reasons that firms set targets, and if they're not going to be met, the reasons why. In contrast, the FCA has not amended its rules and guidance to require culture or account or diversity and inclusion to be allocated to a specific senior management function holder. Notwithstanding this, as Georgina mentioned, the board still has a key role, a very active role, and the key word's active there, in defining its diversity and inclusion strategy. As Asha mentioned, at BDO, I personally lead much of our board effectiveness review work, clients across the financial services sector. And over time, I've observed diversity and inclusion becoming increasingly important and moving up further up the, the board agenda, and rightly so. Most boards recognize the importance of maintaining a diverse board and instilling an inclusive culture within the organization. And most in my experience can actually talk a good game about all the initiatives they're progressing and commonly have diversity inclusion strategies or policy. But very few actually explain how they're gonna action them. And that is what this consultation paper is really turning the dial on. It's not just expecting strategies that set clear objectives, but actually ensuring firms have actionable and measurable plans in place. The real challenge for firms, and it's, it's, it is quite a challenge, is embedding those intended outcomes and the culture across the organization. There should be senior and executive leader sponsorship including a real focus on developing talent internally. And you heard Sasha talk about board succession planning. This is no longer an HR led agenda. The firms that we expect to be on the front foot 
are the ones which engage key stakeholders across the business, from your board to executive management, HR, compliance, internal audit. And that's quite a nice segue for me to discuss how we see firms are practically preparing for the go live date across the three lines of defense. I completely agree with Sasha that it's important not to think of diversity inclusion as a standalone one-off piece of regulatory compliance work. As a parallel, I recall when I was supporting a number of firms with SMCR and its implementation, many would appoint a project manager or obtain external assurance with limited board or management ownership or accountability. And whilst those regulatory requirements were fulfilled from a design perspective, and everyone was very happy, when the regime actually went live and in BAU, it went pear-shaped for a number of organizations. Since then, the regulatory environment has heightened even further. Lessons have been learned by management. So I expect many organizations and boards such as yourselves and those of you in the room might be more alive to that risk now and better prepared to mitigate it. As you might expect across the market, we're seeing a lot of activity within the second and third lines of defense in particular. And there's th three key ways primarily that we've been seeing this. The first are assurance reviews. So those could be third line internal audit or second line compliance monitoring reviews, specifically looking at diversity and inclusion and capturing it within their plans or capturing diversity and inclusion within broader governance or cultural reviews. We're also seeing a lot of org organizations obtain external support um, and, and input validation on d &I strategies. For some firms that really want to go onto the front foot, we're seeing get them undertake gap analysis against the regulatory requirements. And also training, education. So, you know, whether that's targeted to the board, to the executives accountable, or key stakeholders such as compliance or HR, upskilling individuals on not just the proposed changes, but how can we actually have an impact on our organizations? How can we make it work within our, our firms? I reiterate, and it's critical that to achieve the intended outcomes, diversity and inclusion is not standalone. It's very much linked to culture. It should be seen as the golden thread of the organization linked to the overall strategy of the firm, woven into your ESG strategy, your people and culture strategy, and your broader risk and governance frameworks. The final thought and remark that I'll leave you with actually is a quote I recently came across on the topic, which really resonated with me. Change doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it's working together as an industry to change this. Thank you, and I'll now hand back to Sasha to discuss timelines. Thank you very much, Renik. Thank you. Um, Rima, if we could just pop back the slide. A lot of you had asked actually in advance um, about timing. Where, when is this all going to kick off, particularly on the reg reporting side and also on disclosures? Look, as you can see on the screen here, the rules will come out in 2024. Uh, 12 months from the publication of the rules. This is what you'll see in a lot of the language that the FCA and the PRA use in terms of the reference date. And then there'll be a further three months to make the first report. Now, it's important um, that the regulators really appreciate that firms will need to put in quite a bit of work to get to a position where they're building trust with their colleagues. They're able to really get you know, meaningful data, put systems in place, perhaps where those don't exist now. So the first set of reporting will be on a best efforts basis. And then the second year there, you know, there is an expectation that it is a complete data set. Now, if you look at disclosures, public disclosures, this is very much aligned to your, your reporting cycle, annual reports. And this similarly is in the second year after the rules uh, are in play. Now, of course, you're encouraged to disclose earlier. A lot of firms already do that, particularly the listed firms, but effectively you've got kind of, you know, a year to get your house in order, the rules come into play, and then you'll need to report from there on. Now, Rima, what I wanted to do, what um, is really look at kind of next steps. Next steps are going to be important. And I do have a question about how you're feeling about next steps. Now, the question is looking at kind of what we've said, listening to the key areas, how ready do you think your firm is 
And, and the question, you know, the options are your firm is in a strong position. Uh, you know, your firm's made some really good progress. Your firm has a little way to go thinking about it now. And, you know, for some of you, this could be the first time you've even been, you know, part of a DNI conversation. So it might be, you know, hard to say. I think, you know, reflecting on some of the firms that we speak to, there's a real range of maturity. You know, some firms have been doing this, you know, pre-pandemic. Some firms have been working really hard during and post-pandemic. And um, so there's a few more people to answer. So I'll give it a little bit of time. But I think, you know, what I will say, and we'll come on to this, is when you're thinking about next steps, you really need to make sure that you're not leaving it, you know, to kind of when the rules come out. So look, we've had a majority. Um, let, let's just cut it off there. If we can just share share the results. So a good portion of you feel like your firm is in a reasonably good position. You've made progress, but you know you'll have some work to do. That's a really great place to be. There's you know a number of you that have said you know, your firm is in a really strong position. And, you know, we would expect that there would be some firms that, you know, feel like they do have a little bit of work to do. So thank you very much for sharing that. We're going to go on to next steps. If we can, we'll stop that. Now, you, you heard kind of what Shrenik said, you've heard what Georgina has said. I think the key thing is, is you have to do your own homework on your firm. There are going to be nuances and plenty of differences between each firm, depending on your size, depending on your structure, and depending on if you've you know, started on the journey before. I think it's really um, tempting to look around to other firms, to look around to peers and see what they're doing without really understanding what material risks apply to your business. You know, some questions I've put up here about, you know, do you have a strategy? Thinking about what's in the consultation papers, is it fit for purpose? Is it worth reviewing it at the moment, doing a bit of a gap analysis? As Georgina said, you know, the ESG context here is very important. Firms are placing a lot of resource and a lot of time, both on their disclosures, their reporting and their strategy. How can you make this work for a broader kind of risk framework for your firm. So keep ESG in mind. When it comes to governance and accountability, I think this is where probably firms need to get a bit more kind of robust governance in place. Make sure that, you know, those that are responsible for DNI and for culture and related kind of SMFs do have this in their statement of responsibilities, et cetera. Who is responsible for DNI? As I said, it's not just going to be your HR and your DNI colleagues. And we heard from Shrenik, you know, we're already starting to see these on internal audit plans, risk compliance, but who's involved? So, Rima, the next kind of couple of clicks, if you don't mind, question is for you, the homework for you is where are the gaps? Now, a couple of things to flag for you. The FCA is holding a kind of firm-wide, industry-wide webinar on the 30th of October. If you haven't seen it, we'll send around a link afterwards. Um, it's on the FCA kind of webinar section. But as Georgina said, as we've kind of said on the way, the FCA and the PRA really want to hear from you. Please do consult. Um, the, the deadline is the 18th of December, so really, really encourage you to uh, either do that through your trade bodies, you know, having spoken to a lot of the trade bodies, uh, particularly if you're a smaller firm, you can do that collectively, the trade bodies will help you do that as a group, and for those of you that would like to do that on your own, I think, you know, the regulators would be delighted to hear from you. So we're going to, we've got some time, we're going to go to some questions. Um, so what I will do, I thank you for those that have put questions in the Q&A box. I'm going to come to those. But Georgina, if I can, you know, ask you a really big question. Uh, and a lot of people have asked this in the lead up. Um, we have a lot of campaigners out there. We've got a lot of firms doing, you know, what we would think is, you know, the right thing advanced. And, you know, there are firms that haven't really started. Do you think 
particularly this week we've heard about sexism in the city we've heard the diversity project you know sharing its own findings when it comes to you know misogyny when it comes to non-financial misconduct do you think that the regulators have gone far enough on this point um, that is the million dollar question and the feedback that I have heard to the consultation paper so far is mixed. Um, some organisations think that it's going too far. Um, those tend to be the smaller organisations or the organisations that are the very beginning of their journeys. Um, other organisations, especially the larger or more mature ones um, and the campaign groups, don't think it goes far enough. So in particular, um, in selecting those protected characteristics or other characteristics which should be mandatory in terms of data collection. Some organizations say that doesn't go far enough. There are also concerns that the timeline is very long. So as you mentioned, it's going to be at least a couple of years before we start to get those, those first data publications coming through being transparent. So that's been the feedback. My own personal view is that, you know, this is a huge, societal issue which the regulators on their own cannot fix however the regulators are in a unique position they can mandate you know they can regulate they can enforce unlike many other organizations so what they do is important but they have taken into account the feedback they've received the knowledge they have of where firms are on their journeys um the competing priorities that firms have. And I think that at least for now, this is probably pitched correctly. And the measures, if they make it through into a policy statement and into rules, will change the financial services industry. And in time, will change how that industry feels to employees and to consumers. Thank you very much, Georgina. Um, we also had quite a number of firms making comments um, in advance of this webinar as to, you know, targets. Targets are very controversial, very controversial. And in the discussion paper in particular, the, the overall consensus was firms should be able to set their own targets, but we kind of, you know, encourage the regulator to set the core principles. Now, Shrenik, the, the question was around are we going down the quotas? Are we taking kind of, you know, looking around to our European neighbours who have made this kind of statutory? What what do you think about that? So so look, I think you know it's a very very interesting question, and and I don't have a magic ball, but from my perspective, the targets are currently set on a comply or explain basis. That they're, they're not quotas, and I don't believe quotas will be the the end goal. You know, choosing employees based purely on the background isn't fair, nor is it conducive to a well-run business. But companies, you know, of course, should hire the best candidate for the role. However, in two instances where you have two candidates that are equally qualified, if one of them is from a diverse background, now what I do think now is that DNI will play a, a more important role. It, it may seem, you know, unfair, even discriminatory, but to Georgina's point, you know, it's a sacrifice businesses should be willing to make to ensure equal opportunity in the future. So yeah, I think in, in short, don't believe that's the end goal. Um, however, this has has helped turn the dial. Uh, and, and also, if you if you don't mind, Sasha, I did see a question that, that yes, came through yes, as course, well on, on the chat from 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 one of the audience, just in relation to um, you know third country branches and a number of uh, you know firms that have multiple regulated entities, um, and in those entities, none of them have more than two hundred and fifty employees. So will that will the regulators look across groups or, or are they going to keep it firm specific and the answer is that these proposals are applied on an entity basis so I think that's a really important point to make and um, when, when applying these really look at the composition of individual entities and think about its application to that entity. That's a really great point thank you thank you very much for the question actually another question that came up and, and is related to um, to culture, but also to targets and reporting. And, and Georgina, thank you. I see that you've answered it too. That you'll see when you kind of have a chance to go through the template, the proposed template for reporting, the, the regulators have given firms and, and therefore your employees 
the option of prefer not to say when it comes to data collection. And the question is, how will the PRA and the FCA get meaningful analysis if employees choose prefer not to say? And then there was an extended question of, you know, will this give the regulators an indication of potential cultural issues if too many or a high proportion of individuals choose to prefer not to say? And I think it's right to, to point that out because I do think that the regulators will look mm -hmm. and, you know, identify any disproportionate kind of data where, you know, in some firms in particular where employees do pick that option rather than disclose how they identify for that demographic. And this is why the point is, you know, for something that is, you know, um, a very sensitive topic, perhaps firms that haven't, you know, spent a lot of time building trust, building those communication relationships, you know, setting out the context, setting out those, you know, imperatives with firms, you may find that this comes as a real kind of intrusion to some employees. So it's really important that, you know, your marketing and your comms team work with you on this all line managers work with you on this. The whole firm needs to collectively work together to get the firm in a good place where people do feel safe. They do feel like they understand why you are asking them these questions and what will happen with the data. So absolutely brilliant question. And thank you very much for that. I think we probably have um, one more question. There, there was actually around... The, the inclusion and Georgina I'll have a go but maybe you might want to jump in here too I'll read the question for those that can't see it um you know one of the voluntary kind of aspects of reporting is around inclusion and both the FCA and the PRA know that not every firm right now collects inclusion data so they've used the financial services skills commission to give you a template of some questions you might want to ask now, rightly so, many firms already collect data on psychological safety. So the question is, can you uh, use some of the data you have or, you know, does it have to, you know, come into this format that the regulators have suggested? Look, I think it's a helpful suggestion that the regulators have made. They've given you questions that you might want to ask, but if you feel your existing frameworks meet the actual nuance of what the regulator is trying to collect here, that it should, you know, probably be okay. But Georgina, I mean, what do you think about that? Yes, I think I think that's probably true. I mean, hopefully the questions that the FCA has suggested are largely consistent with what firms are doing already. As you say, they come from the FSSC set of questions anyway. Um, and the question also asks, you know, there's another spin on it, which is, does the FCA expect us to do a kind of separate survey? Um, and I think the answer to that would probably be no. Um, but the ideal position to get to would be a place where you are incorporating the FCA's questions into surveys that you might already be doing your annual employee satisfaction survey or you know anything else you do through your HR systems. Um, that would be the ideal place to be, um, not a place where you're doing several surveys, one to satisfy one need and one to satisfy a regulatory need. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Look, it's 29 past on my clock. Um, I am really, really thankful you've all joined us. Thank you for my panelists today. Thank you to Georgina, to Shrenik and to my colleagues behind the scenes that you can't see, to Rima, to Jennifer, to Sarah, to Gloria, very much for, for helping us prepare for this presentation. Please do continue the conversation with us. We'll send you a summary of the papers after this. We'll send you a recording and please do speak to us um, if you need to, you know, go through any of the measures in more detail. I want to thank you again and wish you a very, very good morning. We will end the session now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.